Hi everyone, welcome to lecture eight. Today we'll be talking about retrieval. Okay, oh, before I start the lecture, I'll actually quickly go through a few questions you ask on discussions. So I know that, um, yeah, sorry that if my reply was too late. Um, I don't know why, but I'm not getting these notifications for some reason. I don't know how, how to make it work. But um, so so um, looks like I think there are a few concerns about you're not sure whether you are doing it right because what you don't know what accuracy you have, you have to aim for. Um, so. Okay, I'll try to, uh, for one thing, don't worry about it too much about accuracy. Although I think it's kind of, yeah, a bit late for me to actually, you know, I think it's due today. So, but still I'll see what I can do about it. But uh, for now, please don't worry too much about the accuracy. Uh, what really matters is that your implementation is, um, correct and if you did implement it correctly then at least you have to aim for something that's not uh sometimes very random chance right like 50 percent but um if you are willing to use your uh free no penalty late days and i'll try to actually give you some idea about the accuracies um probably um tonight or tomorrow morning if that would be useful for you so that you can Look, take a look at that and then see if it's too different from what you already submitted, then you can try to resubmit by using your no penalty late days. Okay. And I think there was another question regarding the, I think 4.3 bonus points, um, which actually deals with using the, uh, I think the wording of the final the first time step for the final class and the first time step for the backward direction was quite confusing. So um, what I meant is when you're using bidirectional LSTM, the backward LSTM will have the last output at the first time step, right? So that's why uh, you, uh, I was asking you to use the first time step and the, the wording changed a bit since I released the homework or the assignment just to clarify it, but it didn't really change what I meant because that's re really the typical way of actually uh, use it, utilizing the bidirectional LSTM. In fact, if you take a look at the bidirectional LSTM, I think in TensorFlow, when you actually um, try to get the output of the module, then you always get the, um, the last output of backward direction, which is basically first time steps output. So there was a follow-up question from MJ73. So with regard to time step, it, it is related to the original input or sequence, not the last time sequence, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So basically what I meant is that, so I mean, I, probably what you're thinking is logical and makes sense. So what I'm kind of asking you to do is should, shouldn't be, um, you know, nonsense um, because it should, it should make sense to everyone. So if you're probably like guessing the meaning and like one of the interpretation is that it makes sense to you why you're doing that way. And the other interpretation doesn't make sense. Then probably what I was trying to say was the, the option that actually makes sense, right? Uh, I'm just trying to do something that makes sense here. Nothing, nothing like super weird. And of course, yeah, I use the time step because um, so, so probably it's not, um, I think, you know, communication is always in many cases ambiguous. So um, I think, yeah, I think in this case, probably diagram will be more helpful. Maybe in the future assignments or I mean, uh, in next semester assignment, I'll put the diagrams, but yeah, thanks for the feedback. Okay. So let's get back to the quiz. So we have three quizzes again, and three questions. I'll put the uh, quiz eight.
launching quiz eight. So you have three minutes. Okay, I'll leave the poll open until we come back to the quiz, but let's start with the recap. And actually there was one question. So regarding the assignment, is it okay not to set input size and hidden size separately in this assignment while implementing RNN and stuff? So I think what you meant is that, is it okay to set differently, right? Not, I think you used the, uh, Well, so yeah, they are independent, but then um, I usually just recommend same just because, you know, why not? But yeah, they don't have to be same though. Yeah, doesn't matter. So at the end, it doesn't matter. So no, you don't have to. Okay, let's go to the re recap. Oh, but then before the recap, a uh, few announcements. So first, please make sure to put your student IDs. I think I did. I said this in the last lecture too, um, so that you do not actually, um, so that your attendance is correctly counted. And if you think you might have, you know, been missed, even if you were here, please uh, chat with uh, Myung, our head TA. And number two, assignment one is due today, but note that you have a seven no penalty late days altogether. Also, if you're using it, please make sure to mention it. Otherwise, we will deduct 10%. So when you're, uh, when you're submitting, you will have to mention that. Um, well, I mean, please mention it. I mean, pr probably we're not gonna really deduct it, but it'll be good for you to do that because there'll be a lot of, uh, you know, 
ping pongs because we're not sure whether you want to use this here or you want to use in the next assignment. So it will be very, uh, you know, painful for both of both of you and TA. So please make sure to be accurate about this. And there will be no lecture on next Monday. I'm pretty sure you guys know, you, you know better than me, I think, yeah. But, and then there will be a final project, um, I would say, hands out tonight. So um, all, of, although uh, it doesn't have much details, I'll be actually discussing about the final project. It's not due like in, uh, you know, immediately or like in two weeks it's due in at, at the, at the uh, um, basically at the end of the semester so but then I want to let you know what the final project is soon enough so that you can prepare for it we'll discuss that later today and assignment two will be released next Wednesday basically around the time that your first assignment is strictly due well it's due today but then you, you might, you can use up to seven penalty, the you know, same seven late days per assignment. And two will be about retrieval. So it will be covering materials up to probably today. Okay, so let's do a recap. So biotagging, we learned that when we're doing token classification, we want to label each token with one of beginning, intermediate, or, or others so that we can actually extract spans. And when we want to extract spans, there are several cases. For instance, if you're trying to extract named entities. So we talked about that, like NER. Uh, named entities are like, you know, Barack Obama, present, I mean, not present, but like United States, they are both entities. Barack Obama is a person named entity and United States is location or organization named entity. But then why do we need both B and I? Because you might have two spends with uh, that they're back to back, in, uh, which means they don't have any space between them. So it's really hard, then it's impossible to in, uh, correctly locate the boundary between those two spends. That's why we have BNI. And we need the BNI for each category. So if the number of categories is N, then number of classes is, is N plus N plus one. One accounts for others and N accounts for beginning and intermediate respectively, which is two N plus one. How do you how would you make a biotagging model? So the simplest way to make create a such model would be actually use a very similar architecture you use for text classification, where you have the same input tokenized sentence, and you have a, a bit different input output. In the text classification, we use the um, the last time step of the LSTM, or concatenation of the last time step of the backward and forward LSTMs, but then in um, Token classification, you wanna have one output per token so that we can actually classify each token separately. And we basically just do the classification token level. Of course here in three-way meant, this is assuming that n equal to one. If it's n equal to arbitrary number, that number then it has to be two n plus one for biotagging. And we just have a then probably distribution for each token and then just basically average those cross entropy losses, just like how we do across different examples. But we can just still use the same kind of model, like bi-directional LSTM. And, oh, okay. So how about the, um, um, can we do other tasks than the biotagging? One popular example is MRC. So in MRC, you're given a question and document and you want to predict the answer. And we, we talk about the fact that here, we can also consider the answer to be a span in the document. So we can actually approach it in the same way, bio tagging way, but we can often do better because we know that there, there's only one answer so that we just actually um, try to instead just, you know, predict where the start is and where the end is and uh, others. And that you can do this token level classification, whether each token is start and or others, but maybe an even better way usually is that instead create a probability distribution for each 
start and end. So that's actually a very popular way. But other things are quite similar. Just have an input concatenation of question and context. You have a, a token level classification, but instead of having a token level three way or, well, in this case, three way, right? Classification, you can instead have a two distributions of start and end. You basically apply softmax across that uh, time, axis, time axis. But the loss will be still the same here. You just basically just take the cross entropy for each probability distribution and then just average them. And you can still use model um, bidirectional LSTM. But there was one important question that LSTM is usually not good enough for long-term dependency. So um, we just actually note the limitation here, but we're not gonna come back to, we're, we're gonna come back to this later, how we can actually fix that. The problem here is that even if the, even though LSTM has something called memory state that can convey information across time, still memory state can be very local. It cannot convey through like tens of words. So we need some direct access. And how we resolve that is actually usually through attention mechanism. We'll actually come back to this after going to the um, <clears throat> text generation where actually the attention was first proposed in. And also now, and after it was proposed in the um, text generation, it was extended to other parts, including like token classification and also text classification. And that also motivates the development of transformer. And also that is basically the building block of modern AR architectures, including BERT. And um, I wanted to mention that question answering and MRC are a bit, have, a, have a bit of a different connotations in that MRC usually assumes that the document is given, but question answering is more of a very generic task that uh, tries to answer questions, what the name entails, right? So it's more about application where the MRC is more about whether machine can understand text. And we are testing that through asking questions and seeing if they get the answers right. But sometimes question answering just refers to MRC. So when people try to make it sure that it's not MRC, but a real uh, you know, question answering, you actually put something at in the beginning I and mean, before the question answering, for instance, you call something like knowledge graph question answering to indicate that you're uh, doing some question answering that depends on some given knowledge graph structure data. Or you can also say open domain question answering where you're question answering based on very large corpus, which is not specific, specific to certain domain, okay? But I, I personally think this is a misnomer I said, and I think it, it, the better name could be something like QA with text data. And we talk about how open domain QA can be approached and we talk about a very simple but quite effective way, which is we use a search engine to reduce number of documents from say millions in Wikipedia. For instance, English Wikipedia has like about 5 million articles to a few documents. These documents can be then put into our uh, MRC model and then just get the answer, just like extractive answer, right? Because we can do token classification to get the answer. And we that's that, that basically motivates the importance of retrieval where the retrieval is, um, the purpose is to reduce our space from millions or billions of passages to a few passages so that we can save time and also be quite um, accurate about our answer. So then we talk about the uh, question and passage embeddings. Well, these are basically the, the fundamental theory behind how the retrieval works. We basically want to map question and passage to some embedding. And we know how we can do this. Um, one way is actually what we're going to talk about today, and the other way is uh, more of a bag of words based, and then that we discussed last lecture, and then once they are mapped to some vector space somehow, then they can be compared by some doing some computing the similarity metric. One uh, simple example was the cosine similarity. So when they're mapped to the same vector space, then the good thing is that these can be uh, passage vectors can be computed offline. And whenever each question comes in, you can uh, try to find the, the closest passage to that question and then just get that as the output. In that case, then you can consider that to be the most similar passage. Then the now question is how can you map query and passage to same vector space? And one easy way to do that is bag of words. Basically, let's say we have a, like 100,000 words. 
then we basically create a vector of 100,000 100, dimensions. And we, for each document, we just turn the dimension on if the corresponding word is in the document and zero otherwise. And we just do that for every document. And then that's really convenient because we get a vector for each document. And then we just can compute the inner product or I mean cosine similarity between these, which means normalize and then do the inner product. And we saw that um, also there are um, not just Unigram, which is just using one word, whether uh, you basically measure each word is contained in the document, but also you can try to measure if uh, a consecutive two words is contained in certain documents. That's called bigram bag of words. And you can do this arbitrary long, ngram, whether n consecutive words are contained in the document. But then here the issue is that um, the vocab size will grow exponentially. Unigram say it's 100,000 words. If you're talking about bigram, theoretically it can be up to 100,000 square, which is how, how large is that? Well, that's like 10 billion. So that's pretty large, right? So, and then if you go to trigram, then it can be even larger, like a trillion. So it be, when it becomes too large, that means your vector will be very sparse because it will be activated in only a few dimensions. And that means that your inner product will be zero anyways for most dimensions. And it's very um, useless and very um, not so useful, right? So, um, but also note that the cosine similarity is often used to compare vectors, which means that they take the normalization. They make the norm to one. If their norm is higher than one or smaller than one, they actually increase normal norm by multiplying certain scale of value. And then do the inner product, which is element-wise multiplication and then summation. And that's exactly why if they have they don't they don't have any overlapping words, then their inner product will be zero. And um, another issue with uh, vanilla bag of words is that it gives the same way to every word. So we want to um, actually assign different weights to different words depending on their importance. Like for, for instance, um, words like is, on are very common words and uh, we don't really care about matching them, right? We actually want to make sure that the query matches with document that has overlap in the important words like Barack Obama, like named entities, for instance. So this basically motivates the invention of TF-IDF, which gives more ways to more important words. So it's, you can think of this as a um, subclass of bag of words. And basically it has the same limitations that bag of words has. For instance, if they don't have any overlapping words then they cannot be compared, but still when they have overlapping words then they can be compared better. That's the main advantage of TF-IDF. And how they work is pretty simple. You multiply two uh, values, TF and IDF. TF measures how, how many times the word appears in the document divided by the, every, uh, the number of words in the document. So, if it appears more then this value will be larger. If, if a cer certain term doesn't appear at all, then its value will be zero. And DF is just um, um, raw count of how many documents have the term T. And this basically, we just inverse it so that we want to measure the, the importance of T. If certain word appears in, in every document, then probably it's not important. Like is, are, these words are probably appearing in every document. But some word, some terms don't appear a lot, so their importance will be large. That's why we divide n by the df, and that's why we call it idf because it's inverse document frequency. And then we take a log because this value value can be very large. And just multiply those two. So we saw that if um, certain terms are really common, then TF-IDF will be very close to zero. Whereas if the certain terms are very rare, they have really high weights so that we make sure that we don't miss them. And the good thing about these sparse vectors is that it allows us to build a very efficient search index called inverted index, because we only have to care about terms that have appeared in query. So we can store that, right? We can store documents separately that um, for each term, how many documents, what kind of documents actually have the term, that term. Then at the end, when we have a query of a few, like three or four terms, then we only have to actually look at the documents that have those terms. 
we don't have to look through the, everything in the corpus or the index. So that's why we can make it a very efficient. And it is inverted index because in this case, the index will not be uh, indexed by document ID, but by term. We have each term and then we actually have document numbers here. This is an inverted, inverted index. And we also talk about BM25, which is um, um, actually, actually my bad, good. Which is IDF times some smart manipulation of TF. Thank you for pointing, pointing this out, I think in the last lecture. And uh, what I wanted to just say is that it's quite similar to TF-IDF and there's some magic in BIN 25 that it just works well in practice. But as I said, just like Bag of Words, it still has the same limitation that uh, you can only match between um, um, match between passage and question only when they have overlapping words or terms. And you cannot actually compare between different words, but similar meanings like good and excellent best. So coming back to the answers, okay. I had a pretty long recap because I think uh, the last lecture's poll was that many of you have didn't really understand it right. So I was trying to make sure everyone now gets it, but I'm gonna end poll now. Everyone answered it, so that's good. Okay. So um, I'm going to first download this in case I forget it. OK. I'm gonna share. All right, so question number one. If we want to use a biotagging model to classify n categories of named entities, how many classes are there all together? Well, the answer is we, have, we need n for b, n for i, and one for o, so it will be two n plus one. Sometimes some people actually try to do this in a way that they only classify uh, they have only different Bs, and but they have same Is. In that case, then it'll be N plus two, but that wasn't in the options. So you know that there, this has to be two N plus one. True or false? TFRF is different from Bagel words in that TFRF can correctly compare between words that have a similar meaning, but different surface forms, such as good and excellent. And we just said, I just said that TFRF have, has the same limitation when it comes to comparing between different words. They simply can't compare them. So this is false. So number three, true or false given two vectors, if their norms are one, then their inner product is equivalent to their cosine similarity. And the definition of cosine similarity is that take the normal, take the uh, first normalize it and then take the inner product. But if you take, if you normalize vectors that are actually whose norms are one, they're actually same, right? Because that's exactly the point of a uh, normalization. So then in, it's basically will be equivalent to inner product. So this should be true. So it looks like very fortunately, I think most people got it right. Congrats, that's very great. All right, so that was a lot of recap, hopefully now, uh, 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 these things make sense to you a bit more. All right, so let's go to lecture eight. So we're gonna cover today dense retrieval, the second stage. So what is the difference between the dense and sparse? So we just discussed sparse, right? So we know that sparse is pretty good for capturing um, lexical information, which is basically whether um, certain word exists in the vector or not. But I have to say that it's difficult to encode syntactic or semantic information simply because you cannot compare between um, different words, different surface form words that have similar meanings. And 
the spoiler is that dense vectors actually are good at capturing syntactic and semantic information, fortunately, because they are very, uh, they actually, the dense vector space is really good for this. But then it's usually difficult to encode precise lexical information. So in practice, in real applications in like Google search, neighbor, they actually uh, try to accommodate both. They try to combine the best of the both worlds. That's usually the ideal. Okay, so if you answer the quiz with the wrong profile, then please um, talk to Myung through email. Yeah, but it shouldn't be a problem if you yeah explain what happened. So the regarding the quiz attendance, it's all um, by Myung. So please chat with her. Okay, so there was a question, can you disambiguate the difference between um, lexical and syntactic? Yeah, so usually lexical is something that's more word-wise. So it's the smallest, um, I'll say, unit of a sentence. So um, lexeme is basically a dictionary. So it's basically a set of words. And when I say lexical information, what I mean by is that um, basically very, um, you know, very, words in, in their independent um, status. Syntactic is more of a grammar, grammar. So whether, for instance, what is a verb, which one is a subject, which one is, uh, you know, pre prepositions, this is, this is syntax, syntax. And syntactic is just the adjective form of syntax. syntax. So it's lexical versus syntax. Does it make sense? And semantics is actually about meaning. So, so usually you can think of this as a four stages of, um, I would say, linguistics. You, search, you first start with the lexical and you move to syntactic or in noun form is syntax. And then you move to semantic and noun form is semantics. Of course, and then the last is actually what people call pragmatics. So syntax, semantics is the meaning and pragmatics actually now includes contextual information. So if you ask the meaning of a sentence without its context, then you're just actually talking about its semantics. But once you start to take the, um, the context, contextual information into account, then it becomes pragmatics. So I'll just give an example. Suppose that I say, um, you know, um, I love Apple. Well, of course, syntactically, maybe you might guess that Apple is probably not a, a common noun, but actually refers to the company Apple. But let's say that we ignore that kind of syntax. Then can you guess what I meant by I love Apple? It's very ambiguous, right? Even if the sentence itself is correct, I mean, it's actually a complete sentence, it's not clear whether what you meant is referring to the fruit apple or the company apple. But then suppose the contextual information was that I was talking about food, then probably what I meant, so I have this conversational history, and then now I'm trying to guess what that apple meant then if the conversation was about some fruit, then you know that it probably it means the fruit apple. Whereas if I was talking about like electronics, I was comparing things between uh, Apple and uh, Samsung Galaxy, then you know that the Apple here probably is actually the company. So that's why contextual information can actually change the meaning. Then the sense of the, um, this, this basically uh, I was ambiguity, we call that uh, pragmatics. Yeah, so I mean, these things are pretty, uh, very interesting linguistic, um, I would say, um, they're very actually, uh, it's, it's, it's part of linguistics. So, um, and it's, it's a bit unfortunate that the graduate school of AI doesn't have, of course, any, um, I would say, linguistic class. I mean, KAIS doesn't have, I think, linguistic class. We have NLP, but probably not super um, core linguistic class. and. Um, 
Okay, so please chat with uh, Myung if you um, actually regarding the uh, your poll. So if you think you you submitted, but maybe it's not, then you can chat with Myung and then basically try to add add, uh, add, add yourself to it. But don't worry about it though. Yeah. But then I I, I cannot I don't want to actually I mean I'm trying not to actually check it at this time because it will take take me time to actually do that for everyone. So please chat with Myung. Uh, I'm just trying to use the current class time for lecture, but let me know if there's an issue through email. Okay. So yeah, well, what I was trying to say is that, yeah, it's a bit unfortunate that Kais doesn't have a linguistic department, but um, if you're actually really interested in this kind of uh, how people define language, then you might want to check out uh, some linguistic classes maybe in other schools too. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the, um, how we can actually do search efficiently. Um, people, suppose that we have dense embeddings, right? Then we want to actually um, search. I mean, actually before doing the search efficiently, I want to first define what search means. Well, what I am by search is that we're given some metric, how we measure between the query and the query vector and the passage vector, or of course, arbitrary vectors. And then you want to measure how similar they are. And there are largely um, four methods people use. There are L2 distance, L1 distance, inner product, and cosine distance. And I want to actually, want, I want to make sure one thing. If you're saying something is distance, then the you are saying that they are very similar or they're very close to each other if their distance is zero, right? Because you want to minimize distance. When they say it's a similarity, then probably what they really mean by is that that number should be high because Usually similarity is a positive thing. So, um, so in this case, then um, cosine distance L1, L2 are distance, and this is similarity. So what does that mean? Um, these lower the better, this is higher the better. And distance there actually um, floor is zero. They cannot be lower than zero. So what is L2? Well, L2 is simply just, um, if you have two vectors, then it's just, um, Root, uh, square root of summation of xi minus yi squared. Simple, right? It's just a very normal Euclidean distance. What is L1? L1 is actually a bit different. You take the absolute value of uh, summations of difference between the two values. Well, actually you don't need the um, absolute value here because if you just sum everything that it will be anyways, absolutes, right? So this is Manhattan distance. So why they're also called Manhattan distance, not just L1? Well, because if you have, um, you know, Manhattan, if you go to Manhattan, then it's all like grid. So if you want to go from here to here, Euclidean distance will be this, but Manhattan distance will be this. So that's why they call it Manhattan distance. How about inner product? We know this, right? We do summation of xi times yi. That's the uh, inner product. And what is cosine distance? Cosine distance is actually one minus cosine similarity. And cosine similarity is very similar to um, inner product. It's just that we divide that by, shall I just make it more? And here are the, um, of course, the, uh, this symbol of a two uh, vertical lines is the L to norm. When it's not when we're not sure, we usually put two in order to indicate that's L to norm. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna stop here, um, and then we're gonna have a, a short break of five minutes, and then I'll see you at four forty-five.
Okay, so welcome back. So there was one question from Sanzar. So you wanted to ask whether dropout should be applied to input or output, and if it's input, does it mean whatever comes from the embedding layer? Okay, so what I meant is that, so LSTM layer, each LSTM layer has the input and output, right? So you can apply either the on the input to the every layer or input, output to the every layer, but not, um, of course, both input and output usually. So just to avoid, I would say, you know, overlap. So actually, never mind. So what I was trying to say is that if you're putting on the input, you're right. It's basically um, whatever comes from embedding layer, if it's for the first layer. But then for the second layer of LSTM, then it's something that's coming out of the, um, the first LSTM. So should apply on the hidden state from previous LSTM cell and I'll be confused. So yeah, so, okay. So I think um, answered it right. So what I meant is that the, um, you should apply to the, whatever comes from the previous layer, whether it's um, hidden state, if it's LSTM, or embedding if it's um, first layer, right? I mean, so if it's first layer, then your input will be embedding. If it's second layer, your input it will be the output of the first LSTM. So I think, is it clear? And next question is, could I use pre-trained globe 6B for by by torch text? So I think you're referring to um, just one, just one second. Oh yeah, so that's right. So yeah, you're welcome to use that. Actually, I didn't know that the Torch text provides globe.6b. So um, that's great. Um, I think in the future, I'll probably explicitly say that you can get it from there because processing the globe6b is a bit, um, well, not hard, but still it's very annoying. So yeah, please feel free to, yeah. And next question from Yasuo is that is the usual practice to apply dropout on both C and H? Okay, so I was trying to make sure of this. So usually you do not apply dropout within the recurrent relation. You apply dropout to the layer. So um, it's not a usual practice to apply dropout within the relation. So you, can, you probably will not apply to C. You only apply to H when it's getting past the next layer. And you might ask why? And the answer is because, so actually, this is actually worth talking about. Um, so you might want to actually read the dropout paper, but there's actually a good reason why you don't want to do that. Well, the, the, the reason for using dropout is because you want to avoid basic overfitting. And you want to make sure that your parameters, um, your weight, I mean, you're overfitting your parameters, right? So your parameters, you're, you're, you want to make sure that your parameters actually um, is affected by dropout only once. But then if you actually define dropout within the recurrent relation, suppose that when you're defining HT and then you're using, um, your, your HT will be dependent on HT minus one, but then if you're using dro uh, dropout in that recurrent relation, then basically when you go up to say H10, then H10 basically depends on Basically, it's the result of dropout of uh, like, you know, 10 times dropout, right? In, in, within that recurrent relationship. So, um, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether that will be really bad, but then at least that was what, uh, that's actually what people usually do. So you might try it out, but then um, I think it's not a good starting point. You might want to try it out after you actually make the, um, the, um, the typical dropout work, which is layer wise. And when I say layer, a single layer is the entire set of, uh, um, you know, computations that involve the same parameters. So another question is, is isn't it good to apply dropout just before the class, class, classifier layer? Yeah, so 
If you do that in a single LSTM, then that will be equivalent to applying dropout to the output of LSTM, right? Do you agree? Yeah, but then don't apply dropout to the output of the, the, the of after classification layer though, because that will be actually messing up a lot of things, apparently, right? I think that's a really good quiz, right? I mean, why does it mess up? Because if you actually drop, uh, drop the last class, I mean, the class logics, then there is no way you can get it right. So don't apply dropout after classifier, but before classifier sounds good. And that's will be equivalent to actually applying class uh, dropout to the output of the LSTM layer in a single LSTM layer case. Okay, so any more question about the assignments? Okay, let's move on. All right, so I think we have a, a really important materials to cover today, which is how can we construct inverted index for, um, well, dense vectors? And we talk about how we can do this for sparse vectors, right? And it's kind of recapping what we discussed today's recap and last lecture. So um, we're doing MIPS. Why are we doing MIPS? Okay, MIPS is standing for maximum inner product search. So we're doing inner product in sparse vectors because I told you that cosine similarity is just uh, one special case of inner product where you actually, your query and passes are both normalized. So you can think of that as a MIPS too. Then uh, we talk about this, consider that um, when we are dealing with sparse vectors, MIPS is very efficient by constructing this inverted index, right? And it's clear that this only works because you know that certain dimension will certain dimension multiplication will be um, non-zero for only special cases, and here the special cases is when you have overlapping words. But when you're now dealing with dense vector, which is now no more um, bag of words, but more of a very arbitrary. Um, vectors where each dimension is representing arbitrary topic. Now that this won't work anymore with dense vectors. And also note that this won't work either if you're using L2 instead of inner product. That's why inner product is so powerful compared to L2. Um, and basically you can, oh, so I might be, um, wait, yep. But then how can we do, um, you know, efficient search for dense embeddings where, where well, in the dense embeddings, of, of course, you have uh, a lot of vectors and you don't want to do exact search because that will be taking a lot of time. So what will be our option? The, so if you do this just like very, um, um, I'll say very brute force way, then the time complexity will be linear in the number of instances or number of documents and passages. But oftentimes we're dealing with billions or if not trillions of documents. And we want the research result to be very fast. Like for instance, there is a 0 0.1 second limit for neighbor search. So what can we do? Because we cannot do exact search, but then we're dealing with, um, we want to be, we cannot do exact search because, you know, we need to be very fast. So how can we actually approximate that? We might be sacrificing the accuracy, but still we can make sure that the search will be fast enough. And fortunately, we can leverage a smooth empirical trade-off between a speed and the accuracy. So basically what we want to do just is that we need to find the sweet spot. 
But of course, there is a trade-off, which means that you cannot achieve, you, can, you are not guaranteed to achieve 100% accuracy with very fast retrieval engine. It's like uh, you have to sacrifice something, either speed or the accuracy. So we're going to see how that works. It's actually quite simple, though. And there's a lot of a theory behind this. I actually put a reading list on the um, schedule if you're interested how actually people come up with some theories, the trade-off between the speed and accuracy. But I also want to tell you that the trade-off is very theoretical. I mean, in the paper, the theoretical trade-off is actually not very sometimes correlated with the practical trade-off, meaning that you might have a really bad theoretical bound, bound for some retrievable system, but in practice that might work really well. So just wanted to make sure that you understand the difference between theory and uh, practical applications. So how can we then approximate these? So I'll give you just like a, a, a few ideas. So number idea number one is that we can create a few buckets and put nearby points to the same bucket. Then question is, um, how many buckets? So what that means is that suppose that we have a lot of uh, dense embedding points. Then we just basically create a bucket that basically include maybe these points and these points and also maybe these points. This will be bucket one, bucket two, and bucket three. And by doing so, when we have a new query coming in, like here, we make sure that we only visit a subset of buckets that are closest to the, the query point. In this case, probably the closest buckets will be B3 and B2. We can just skip B1. So, and then we just do exact search within these buckets. Of course, in this case, we only are skipping like one third of the, every po uh, the, the uh, entire set of points. So we only have a speed up of like uh, one third. But let's say we have like, say, um, for instance, how many buckets? Like say we have 1 million buckets and then we visit um, closest like uh, uh, 1K buckets. Then in that case, we're having speed up of uh, 1,000 1, times, right? Because we don't have to visit the other 999K buckets. And then the question is then, how can we define the buckets, which means how we decide which bucket to put each in. And there are uh, largely two methods. One is locality sensitive hashing, which is also called LSH. So in this method, we just basically, um, basically um, put points that are, that are close to each other together under the chosen metric. And then basically we just continue doing that. Um, and another method is clustering based which is we use k-means clustering to create a cent create centroids and each point is mapped to the closest centroid. So um, the, the difference between these two is that LSH usually have a better theoretical, um, I would say bounds. So we, have, we know better bounds with LSH. I'm not saying there is no bound for clustering. It's just that uh, LSH is usually mathematically more convenient, but then in practice, clustering-based methods work better in the sense that it's easier to create these clusters and also it's, it, work, it has a higher accuracy or better speed and uh, accuracy trade-off. So we'll be actually talking about clustering-based method in this lecture, but just note that there is a, something called LSH, or quality sensitive hashing, and has pretty good theories or theoretical bounds. And clustering-based method is quite simple. What that it does is that you just use k-means clustering, and k-means is just the iterative, um, you know, process of creating the clusters. So I can just briefly explain what um, k-means is. And here, suppose that you start with uh, these points, and you basically just guess randomly guess where the, the centroids will be. Let's say that we, are, we have a three buckets. We're gonna work with three buckets. Then actually this is not a good diagram, my bad. I will assume that actually the, there are actually very good 
three clusters, right? And then suppose that we just guess the initial locations of um, the buckets or the centroids, which will be something like here and here and here. Well, these look really bad, right? I mean, they are not represented of uh, these clusters. But then once you have just, um, you know, you start with this initial positions, what you do first is that you basically assign the, for each point, assign each point to the closest cluster. So in this case, probably um, boundary will be basically, so the really, actually I'll actually make a bit good, better boundary. Um, I mean, better starting point, just to make sure that this actually converts pretty fast, but of course it doesn't have to be uh, super good initially. Something like that. Then initially you basically assign each point to the closest centroid, that, which means basically you're actually drawing um, uh, imaginary boundaries between these points. And that's just very simple. It's just like that, right? So although we started with really bad um, initial centroids, but that we know that the boundaries will be here. Oh, sorry. So I'm just being trying to be super accurate. Like that, okay? So whatever comes um, in each uh, region will be, corresponding to that centroid. That will be the closest centroid. Then suppose then, then after that, you basically assign the, the centroids and now you compute the new centroids based on the points that you have assigned it to. So this will be what um, centroid one, iteration one. And then this will be now moved to centroid one, iteration two. And this will be moved to centroid one, iteration two. But this was centroid one, iteration one. Cent oh no, centroid, well, centroid two, iteration one, centroid two, centroid three, iteration one, and the new centroid will be uh, here, which is centroid three, iteration two. And with just one iteration, we know now that we have kind of converged, right? Because we have pretty good centroids that no more uh, assignment changes. Because with the new centroids, if you actually draw the, um, the boundary again, it's actually quite similar because the, the, it will be here. This will be like this, and this will be like. So this is basically iteration two. And now you get, you get why um, this can be converged really fast in a really efficient manner. And also assigning these centroids is just basically computing the distances and when you're computing distances, you're basically doing a lot of matrix multiplication. So it can be also be very efficient on GPUs. It's, it can be paralyzed. So if you use GPUs, you can actually do clustering really fast, like millions of points you can do within like a few seconds or minutes. That's why actually clustering is also preferred to other methods. So idea number two is that we can instead try to create a proximity graph where you're, you can create a graph where points are vertices and nearby points have edges. And we start from the root vertex and iteratively traverse to nearby vertices until you find a close enough vertex, which is basically local minima. Distance is smaller than a threshold, right? And this is actually called hierarchical, I mean, they, so basically this is a called proximity graph based method. And one of the dominant methods that actually uses this is HNSW which is considered currently the state of the art in terms of the accuracy, but, and also speed trade-off. But then the big disadvantage of this method is that it takes up a lot of space. And also it takes a lot of time to build a graph. So that's why people usually don't uh, prefer this alone, but what people usually do instead is that they combine H and SW with the clustering method. So idea number one and idea number two combined. And there are very, um, um, NNS is very popular task that a lot of people need in many different scenarios, not just NLP and not just K, but then also like image search. Okay, what does, okay, so I have a question. Can we solve neural network? So 
What does that mean? Could you please clarify? What do you, what do you mean by we can can we solve your network? Okay. You mean for which part? Which little part or the um, embedding part? Okay, so you're talking about can we find the nearest neighbor with neural network? Well, you can think of this as a neural network already because you're basically doing the inner product between vectors, if that's what you meant. Um, but I don't think we have a super good idea or much uh, a, a better idea than this for now. But if you can find one, that would be nice. Okay, so nearest neighbor search is actually not just limited to question answering, but it's being used in many different applications that um, you probably don't want to build your own nearest neighbor search algorithm. Whether you want to use open source ones, and it's pretty important to do so because it's kind of self-contained problem, so why not? So there are, I think, largely, um, there are more, but then I uh, recommend you to, to take a look at this three libraries, Feist, Annoy, and Scikit-Learn. Feist is by Facebook, Annoy is by Spotify, and Scikit-Learn is just a very popular open source in this um, machine learning, right? And we, in this class, will be using Feist, which is very nice for dense retrieval, dense embedding retrieval. So actually, I, have a, I wanted to actually go for a very short tutorial I was actually going to do the coding, but I don't think we'll have time. So I'll just actually go through the uh, tutorial code. But before that, I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of the final project because um, we covered everything we needed to at least discuss final project. And the final project will be, the instruction will be uploaded today. And you will need to indicate in two weeks from today. So it's basically, uh, one week after assignment one is due and one week before the, uh, I would say, um, no, my bad. Two weeks is actually one week after assignment two is announced, but before one week before is due. So right in the between, uh, right in the middle of assignment two, you will have to uh, indicate which option you will be choosing. So you have two options. Option number one, your own project, uh, by the way, this accounts for 40%, um, but you can choose to make it 0% uh, by doing all the assignments. We'll have four assignments, but if you actually choose this 40%, then you will only have to do two assignments of your choice. So actually there is actually three options, right? Don't do it. And neighbor students will not be actually doing final projects. I mean, not that, yeah, they will not be doing final project, right? I think I mentioned that because I don't, I don't think it's really makes sense to um, just do the final project and no assignment for a class. So, yeah. This is only for the Kai students. And um, so what I was trying to say is that the option number one is that your own project and Really, the important requirement here is that you have to be the first author of, or, or co-first author. So if you're a second author, then I'm sorry, but you cannot use that um, for your final project. And the project must be aiming for a top tier conference or workshop publication. So it's just basically a requirement that um, you know, you're actually publishing this some, somewhere so, because it can be also workshop. So I said top tier, but actually um, I'm just talking about conferences that are not you know, BS. There are some actually really weird conferences too. So, and um, the project must be related to NLP, which is apparent, right? Because we're doing NLP in this class. Um, option number two is that if you don't have any project in mind or ongoing project, so I, I recommend you to choose option one if you're working on something and you're trying to, for instance, submit to some upcoming conference. But if you're not, then I recommend you to work on option two. And here 
is that the default is that you work on your own, but then you are allowed to create a team of max two students, which means you will have up to one collaborator. And you will need to actually mention this as well when you're some uh, indicating uh, two weeks from today. There will be basically submitting a Google form. So I'll actually give you the link uh, tonight with these instru instructions. So please do so. It's, it will be like a one minute thing. But still, you will need to define. You will need to determine how what you're gonna be doing and who you're gonna be doing with in two weeks, so that you have at least um, I would say about one and a half month to work on. Actually, almost two month two months to work on your final project. So slowly, at least, right? So just talking about final project option two. This will be about open domain question answering. And I'm going to, we're going to give you a baseline code where you can start from. And some of the code actually will be coming from what we're going to be learning in future. So don't worry about it, even if you don't understand it yet. And your final project can be about one or more, uh, 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 one or more of the followings, which is you, you will be given a baseline that actually does open domain question answering. It's basically, it actually answers questions from, um, and, you know, so, and then given a large text corpus, and then your final project will be about whether you, you try to improve the baseline's accuracy, baseline speed, or you minimize baseline's memory footprint, or you analyze the pros and cons of dense and sparse retrieval, for instance. So there, I mean, and you can also think of other options too, as long as it's about open domain question answering. Okay. And then I'll conclude today's lecture with very brief um, tutorial with advice. So how this works. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, so I think you see the Google Chrome. So I'll first show you how you can actually create an index of a uh, without any approximation. In this case, you basically just do, do the brute force, brute force search. So here, you first define dimension, which is the embedding size, right? And then you basically define the database size, which is just basically how many documents or passages you have in your database. And you have an NQ, which is number of queries. We define this because um, in real applications, in many cases, you want to search multiple queries at a time to make it efficient not just one query. So you can think of this just as an efficiency thing and don't worry about it too much. And then we just make it uh, random seed to make it reproducible. And then we create a database, which is XB, and we create a quer uh, queries, which is XQ. And of course, um, XQ, they're both random, right? Just, just This is just for you know um, toy, toy experiments. And then how we build an index with FICE is that we first import FICE and then we build a flat index. And then um, this is just um, you know index, you just basically don't have to train it because there is nothing to tune. It's a flat index that you just do brute force search. And the L2 here meaning that you're doing L2 distance instead of inner product. And then you add the data points to the index. You can of course print the total number of data points and K is the uh, how many top results you want to get. And you perform search by index.search and then you actually perform search with the um, here, just five, first five instances of the database, just to make sure that if you actually can in retrieve correct ones, of course, if you just search the fi first five instances, then what you get from it will be the actually first five instances, right? They're exactly the same and K is four and that's uh, D, D, I comes out. If you print I, there will be the indices of the, um, the, um, the, the retrieved documents and D will be actual scores. And you can do the, this DI with the queries too. I mean, this will be actual queries, but here you just define with random, um, MP.random, so this doesn't really mean anything. 
But I think this should be clear. Hopefully, maybe we can we can uh, discuss a bit more about other, um, especially how we can do the clustering thing, which is the the second file here, how we do clustering. But we're gonna discuss this probably like next lecture pretty briefly if we have time. But for now, I think that should be enough. And yep, I think so. We can end today's lecture here, but I wanna just do a really brief a poll to see how the lecture was, just like how we do every lecture. And just give me a really quick feedback. Okay, so one minute. There was one question. Okay, there was a question that should we submit the paper of the first project before semester ended? Um, no, so no, it doesn't have to be submitted this semester. It's just that something you're working on. So for instance, if you're working on a February deadline, that's fine. Just submit whatever you're working on. It doesn't have to be you know complete um, you know, something has to be, doesn't have to be the final camera ready quality version, something that you're working on, intermediate results fine. Okay. Okay, so yeah, looks like today's lecture was harder than um, previous lecture. So maybe reachable is a bit not super clear to everyone. So we'll see, hopefully the assignment makes this all um you know helps you understand these maybe not so let's see how this goes but uh retrieval lecture is we, today's lecture is the last lecture of the retrieval and starting from next lecture we're going to move to general text generation so um hopefully you can um, have better understanding of retrieval when you start your assignments okay all right i'm gonna just actually save this But anyway, so thank you for your time today. So um, please submit your assignment one, look out for the final project announcement today, and I will see you next Wednesday because there is no lecture on Monday. Thanks. And TAs, please, yeah, we're gonna meet on the Google Meet link.